Uh, every year at consensus, Bitcoin does something exciting, whether it's having a giant spike or, you know, who knows. Uh, but we are only an hour away on the uh, Coindesk having clock. So this only happens every four years. It's like the presidential election of Bitcoin. Uh, the, the block rewards are about to cut in half. And this is the event everyone's been waiting for. Is it priced in? Is it not priced in? Who knows? But uh, we're not here to talk about Bitcoin. We're here to talk about other blockchains. It's the battle for the base layer here on Coindesk TV. And up next, we have Kathleen Brightman, uh, who gave the greatest quote in crypto news uh, in 2018. Sadly, not in Coindesk. When she said in Wired, they messed with the wrong nerds. Kathleen, co-founder of Tezos here at Consensus. Great to have you. How's Singapore, Kathleen? Oh, it's um, it's early in the morning here. <laughs> um, I come from the future. I can tell you, it's it's no better on Tuesday than it is Monday. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for the kind words, Brady. Yeah, sure. Well, great to have you. Um, so the thing Tezos is known for, and the and the difference maker that it proposes is, uh, you know, we heard from you to Steiner before that uh, blockchains have to be able to update. They have to be able to change. Software has to be able to change. That's what you guys were built to do. You were built to um give a community a way to update the blockchain. So could you tell us about the, the amendment process and maybe specifically about the first actual amendment that happened in Tezos's code? Oh, sure. Yeah, no, um, Yuta is a very tough act to follow, unfortunately, and she stole some of my talking points, but um, uh, but I'll try my best to, you know, add something new to the mix. Um, yeah, so to your point, um, Tezos was conceived back in 2014 before there was this concept of a bloodless civil war, um, as we've seen in, in Bitcoin land, um, or the notion of like an ETH 2.0 or, or this concept of um, improving on uh, the first version of a blockchain through a wholesale um, uh, upgrade, right, that takes a massive, massive coordination and uh, an indefinite timeline. Um, so Tezos was really born of a time um, when we saw the first innovations come into the blockchain space, like the cryptocurrency space, um, through proposals like Litecoin, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, what we observed at the time was that, um, you know, it's great that there were all these um, innovations coming to the fore. Well, the pity was that um, network effects were potentially being lost um, by introducing all of these improvements um, through unique cryptocurrencies that had to, you know, kind of bootstrap their network effects, um, you know, when they were launched in parallel. And wouldn't it just be easier if we consolidated these things <laughs> and uh, were able to upgrade them in a, in a legitimizing way um, and had a forum to come to consensus on what is a legitimate upgrade and what isn't, right? Um, and so that's really what Tezos is born of, is, is, is a spirit of keeping up with um, the latest in research and the latest in um, you know, innovation, um, but also giving a coherent platform to grant legitimacy to any upgrade that can be conceived by a community. Um, the cool thing about Tezos is that we have sort of a, um, uh, an approach that uh, really emphasizes iteration. Um, so even the governance model itself can be upgraded, right? Um, which I think is really cool. Um, in the first cut, we have a, a sort of weighted vote um, with you know four distinct, um, four distinct phases, right? So you have a proposal period, an exploration vote period, and a testing period. And then finally, you know, you can promote um, the upgrade to, you know, be the new canonical version of the chain. Um, so far, the Tezos community has decided or elected to do that three times. Um, and so we're hoping that this summer will mark the fourth. Um, uh, and what's that like? Like, what's it? I mean, I understand that's like the process, but, but like, what's it like culturally? Like, what happens? Like, where did that all begin? Um, you know, <laughs> who sort of writes the things out? Like, uh, do people get all jazzed about it on Twitter? Like, what, what's the, what's sort of the internal story? Oh, I'm glad you asked because like really if you go off of, um, you know, just bare social media, it's kind of like, it's hard to glean what the dynamics are. Um, there are forums and there are, you know, things like topics on Reddit. There's a, um, I guess, Tezos specific forum called Agora, which is delightful. Um, and uh, people talk about the pros and cons of upgrades there. Um, but really because, you know, there's a dynamic um, cottage industry on baking or validating the ledger and that's the main mechanism through which um, proposals are ratified. Um, there's also this this uh, sense of sort of liquid democracy going on. So people will sometimes pick um, their validator or validate themselves based on um, how they want to shape the blockchain and how active they want to be. And so you find some people who are very passive and some people who are very active um, or vocal or not. But what's kind of interesting is that the threshold for actually um, ratifying an amendment um, was set quite high to be rather conservative at first. And um, every time that you know, the Tezos community has gotten together to consider these proposals, um, they've met 
decorum or, you know, far exceeded it sometimes uh, to the point where um, it's getting higher and higher. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we have, to, we have to be a little careful about that. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a fun, it's kind of a fun fact that like everyone is so active in this community, whether through delegation or through um, running a baker themselves. And at this point we have around, um, you know, 450 uh, you know, unique uh, bakers in the, in the ecosystem. And I hope that number grows over time. Cool. Yeah, Kathleen, great to have you. Just kind of jumping off from that point, the bakers, we see that a lot of people are moving their Tezos onto centralized exchanges. Can you tell us why that does matter or doesn't matter? Um, you know, I think uh, I think it points to the diversity of the Tezos community. Like, um, you know, granted, you have some people who are hardcore um, hobbyists and who've learned to like program for the sole purpose of um, participating and, and being involved in the baking ecosystem. Um, but you know, some people just want to be more passive, and uh, and for them, I think you know, a centralized exchange like Coinbase, for example, um, is is a great option. Um, and it's great to see you know a diversity of. Um, participants because uh, there are some contributions that you can make if you're a company the size of Coinbase with the means of Coinbase, um, you know, doing research into the chain, so on and so forth, um, that maybe a hobbyist wouldn't be able to do. Um, but the hobbyists have also um, moved the ball forward a lot in terms of like, uh, you know, enforcing cultural values of the, of the Tezos community. So um, it's, it's really just a, a matter of um, seeing people's, you know, s s sort of uh, <laughs> taste. Um, and this, and on the cultural question, this this high voter turnout point that you made is interesting. I mean, that isn't something we see on a lot of blockchains. Um, usually, turnout is just sort of barely what it needs to be. Uh, what do you think the difference maker was for Tezos? I mean, I think probably the cynical person would guess it's it's largely can be ascribed to a few big bakers probably vote, and that's how you get it. But maybe there's more to the story. So, could you tell us sort of where you believe the high voter turnout comes from? Yeah. Um, well, I think. I think sort of the un uh, it's it's a little bit um un unsaid but um uh, I think the narrative in 2017 2018 2019 has, has been all about like talking about technology um but I like to think that technology is just sort of the table stakes right like it's it's that's the bare minimum that you need <laughs> we all have great technologies um you know every project that's been presenting so far has really smart people behind it um but I think ultimately these things rise and fall by their narrative um, and the sense of community behind it. And I think the Tezos like community for, for whatever reason is particularly cohesive um, and, and passionate. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you could, you could cynically say that, but uh, that, you know, it's just a handful of people. I, I think the facts would betray a slightly different story. Um, but even so it, it does um, require at least to the base, um, a large fraction of the people who, um, you know, own Tezos tokens um, to participate in Prima Fossi. And, and we've seen quite a bit of, quite a bit of that. Um, so I, I, I do think it's the story. It's the narrative. It's the um, uh, sort of uh, guidepost and, and sort of collective goal um, that empowers people. Also, you know, Tezos is unique in that it, um, allows people who um, even just own one or two tokens to really participate in the governance process and feel like they own it. And I think that sense of um, uh, enfranchisement um, really lends itself to a more powerful community than people realize. Uh, just kind of moving away from that subject into a different space entirely. Tezos, when I think of it, normally is like a security token platform, but we also see some new developments with DeFi bringing Bitcoin on the last, I think it was last year or so, or uh, last month or so. So how would you classify Tezos? Is it Ethereum competitor as it's bringing on DeFi or is it its own like security token platform? What is Tezos? Oh man. Um, yeah, I mean, personally, um, and obviously my opinions don't dictate what the direction of the mm -hmm. um, cryptocurrency, but um, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of like the STO uh, platform play. So, I mean, just putting yeah. my cards out on the table. Um, I don't think it creates a very viable moat. Um, and I don't think it's just that interesting as a use case. Um, I think DeFi is much more interesting. I think lowering the ticket price um, for people to become part of a uh, sort of global community um, is, is much more interesting in the long run. Um, I think that even things like gaming and, and collectibles are also just like a more high value um, way to capture and um, and build a moat around the ecosystem. Um, uh, so, I mean, I guess to answer your question, um, you know, the Tezos position paper, which I think we've held pretty true to in the sense that um, it's, it, you know, 
it doesn't propose Tezos as anything other than um, an attempt to be money um, <laughs> and a, a better way to be money um, by incorporating new features into the protocol dynamically. Um, I still think that that's the goal. Um, I still think that's what we're shooting for, um, though obviously the applications that sit on top of um, a, you know open source project you can't really do much about. <laughs> um, so it's it's good to see people from the security token world coming in. Um, you know, Lord knows I've been wrong about so many things that I, I, it's not my place to besmirch them. Um, but uh, but it, it is the case that I think that um, you know trying to replicate finance and trying to replicate the models that have um, made money uh, good is is really where I think um, we'll see value that preserves itself for the long run. When, so you're building a use, use case. I got a little preview of it a little while ago with the emergence game. Uh, earlier today, we heard Joe Lubin say that Gods Unchained is going to go viral. Uh, so you've got them, you know, out ahead of you. When can we expect to see emergence? Uh, why is it gonna, you know, beat Gods Unchained? You know, what what's the um, what's the game plan here? Yeah, no, glad you asked. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I am also the CEO of another company called Coast. Um, Coast's goal is to um, make better secondaries markets, and so the first and most intractable issue that we um, identified was in collectible card games, um, digital collectible card games, that is. And yes, so God of the Gods Unchained tries to do a very similar thing. Um, we think that we do things a little bit differently. Um, we have a different auction rental contract uh, model that I think uh, differentiates us. But at the end of the day, like um, what I really have conviction in is the quality of the game. Um, and uh, and I think the economics are secondary. They create a virtuous cycle. I think that that um, you know creates longevity over time. But um, really, what what is going to bring people in and, and grow the pie um, is appealing to people who are collectible card games enthusiasts um, and giving them a better economic structure um, on the back. Um, but initially, I, I think that we're just going to be a more fun game to play. Um, right. But uh, will be in the pudding. Um, so we hope to do something uh, uh, alpha during the next month. So uh, it's super it's superheroes versus wizards and monsters. Uh, so that's one use case uh, for Tezos as a base layer. Of course, there's also security tokens and there's money. This is the thing about base layers. They have to do lots and lots of different things. Uh, and we're watching the battle take place right now. Thanks a ton, uh, Kathleen, for coming on to Coindesk TV. That was great. Thank you for having me.